Good morning, everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of closing you out last night and welcoming, welcoming you to this morning. Um, so let's see if I can get, there we go. Uh, so my goal for this very brief talk, just to start us off today, is to give you a sort of mental schematic for what clean meat production might actually look like at scale so that you can have that rattling around as we're hearing all of the um, incredible discussion that I'm excited for throughout the day. Uh, I also want to delve into some of the critical technology areas that need to come to fruition to make this commercially feasible and get clean meat out into the world and introduce some terminology for those of you that this is maybe a new area uh, so that we've got that in our back pocket for these discussions on stage. Uh, and then finally, I'll end with kind of providing a framework for the various sessions throughout the day and how they all fit together. So, so what is clean meat? Let's start with a definition of what we're talking about here. Um, so when we say clean meat, we're talking about genuine animal meat. We're talking about all of the sensory aspects, the consumer experience of conventional meat, but made by growing the relevant cell types muscle cells, fat cells, connective tissue in culture, and arranging them in the same sort of spatial structure that gives us the mouthfeel and that, that true consumer sensory experience that we expect from meat. As uh, Bruce just mentioned, we are honored to have with us today many of the pioneers in this field. Um, and I, I hope the dates on this slide just give you a sense of how quickly this has accelerated. What we're talking about here is a platform where the end product, be it species or product type, product category, is really quite malleable. This is a very powerful technology, a very powerful approach uh, to really address a lot of these issues and allow us to iterate quickly once we solve some of these initial scaling challenges and engineering hurdles. So just to walk us through what this might actually look like at scale, the first step for anyone in this space is to derive their initial starting cells. So these can be taken in a number of different ways, from a biopsy from an adult animal, um, where you can work with adult stem cells, you can, um, you can induce cells to go back to a pluripotent state, and we'll talk about that term in a second. Um, you can start with embryonic stem cells. Any cells that grow and divide are, and are able to ultimately get to these desired final cell types, again, fat, muscle, et cetera, uh, are, are candidates for this process. Then you, you take those starter cells and go into what's called a seed train. So that's kind of scaling up the number of cells that you're working with. And from there, you go into true large-scale production, where we can think about a kind of two-phase process. The first phase is your cell proliferation phase. So this is simply where you're, you're taking your small number of cells, multiplying them, dividing them into a very large number of cells. We can, we're able to capitalize on this beautiful biological principle of exponential growth. One cell becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, et cetera. Uh, that's really the beauty of this platform. From there, uh, you can go into the next stage, which is where you actually take that cell biomass and convert it into those desired final cell types and get it in the structural arrangement that you're looking for. Now, this, this uh, schematic here is kind of a generalized process. Each company will take a slightly different approach here. Some companies that are, are going for, say, minced meat products or um, muscle tissue as an ingredient in a processed meat product might not necessarily have the same dependence on sort of scaffolding and this, this second uh, tissue phase of the process. Uh, but this kind of gives us at least some sense of various aspects of this that companies may incorporate. Here's our clean meat industry mind map. Many of you may have seen this either as the graphic or, or through our white paper around this that just kind of points out some of the technology development areas that are really critical to bring the hub here, clean meat, to commercial fruition. Um, we have supply chain and distribution on there just so that we don't lose sight of the fact that we will either need to build a supply chain for this industry or adapt existing supply chains. Um, I won't delve into that more here, but what I'll focus on for just a moment each is each of the other four categories here. 
So the cell lines, the cell culture media, the scaffolding, and then the bioreactors, which house this entire process. So the cell lines, there's a number of uh, terms here that I just want to put um, in front of you so you're, you're familiar with them if you hear them on stage. So the cells we can work with in this process can be pluripotent, which means they can become any cell type in the body. They could become nerve cells, bone cells, muscle cells, et cetera. Um, they could be multipotent, which means they have some options in terms of final cell type, but they can't necessarily go in any direction. Or they can be more specialized cell types. So for example, an adult muscle stem cell that really is fated to go one direction. Uh, and the choice of which of these types of cells to work with uh, depends on a number of factors, both from an economic perspective as well as you know, how easy is the biology to finesse these cells to become what you want them to become. Proliferative capacity is another important term. So that simply means how many times can you get these cells to double and divide and reproduce. So if you're talking about a large scale system where you want to capitalize at the high end of that exponential curve, every additional doubling you can get out of your cells really has, has significant impact uh, at an economic level. Stability is a term that refers to the ability to, to have cells that perform in a predictable way, generation after generation, batch after batch, so that you can build a robust industrial scale process around this. The cell culture medium is essentially the nutrients that are feeding these cells. Just like any biological system, they're taking in calories and, and, and nutrients and converting those into cellular biomass. Uh, and there's two components of this that I, I think are probably most relevant for the discussions we'll be having. The first is the basal medium. So these are all of those kind of bulk nutrients, um, salts, sugars, amino acids, the things that actually go into building the parts of the cell, relatively cheap ingredients. And then there's another fraction of the medium that's relatively small in terms of volume, um, but is, is pretty important, and that's the growth factors. So these are simply signaling molecules, often proteins, that are telling the cells what to do in this culture environment. Um, so do you want them to adhere to a surface, float around in suspension, stay in a stem cell-like state, or start to differentiate, and if so, into what final cell type? For the scaffolding, again, this is at its simplest, just kind of a 3D support structure that is, is giving that, um, that, that depth to the cells, allowing them to adhere to it and then mature into their final forms. You can also use the scaffolding to help guide that differentiation and to help pattern uh, what you ultimately end up with as your final product. So imagine getting to define with your scaffold what your marbling pattern looks like. Um, in some cases, scaffolds can be engineered to biodegrade, so the cells can actually break them down as they grow on them and replace that material with their own material, which is called extracellular matrix, to form their own kind of environment and cocoon. Um, or, or you can have them remain integrated into the final product. So again, company to company, there's many different approaches being explored here. One of the key attributes for any scaffold is the porosity, the ability for uh, that nutrient media that we just talked about to be able to flow through and penetrate even to the thickest, deepest portions of that scaffold. Uh, so that's a really critical parameter in this field. Another term that you might hear um, throughout the day is microcarriers. This is, um, could be argued to be kind of a subset of scaffolding. Uh, so these are essentially little beads that you can adhere cells onto um, that, that could be used even in that proliferation phase of this process. Uh, some cells like to adhere to surfaces rather than just kind of free floating around. Um, so there's some similarities between the materials that you might use for those microcarriers and materials you, could, you would use in uh, an actual thick tissue scaffold. And then finally, the bioreactors. These might take pretty different forms depending on how each company is approaching what, this, you know, what their final product will be and what this looks like at scale. For the proliferation phase, if you have cells growing in suspension, again, you're, you're not trying to form them into a tissue, but simply 
expand your number of cells, increase your cell biomass. We have pretty good proxies from other fields for what large-scale reactors look like for animal cell culture processes at that scale. Uh, the biopharma industry, for instance, has 20,000 liter tanks and larger growing uh, animal cells. On the tissue perfusion side, once we get to the point of seeding cells onto a scaffold, perfusing media through, and ultimately harvesting that tissue as meat, um, some, some uh, models for this exist at smaller scales, but I think here this is a really juicy area for some engineering uh, to figure out how we um, automate this and, and scale this up to make this economically viable for those more complex, sophisticated tissue-like products. So again, here's just our mind map for this sort of environmental context uh, that's, that's contributing to this field. And I think there's, for every single one of these bubbles, we can draw a lot from parallel industries. So you'll hear that as a theme throughout today, um, is what other fields should we be looking to, to look for enabling technologies that we can pull in here. In many cases, there are direct parallels and people simply haven't made that connection, haven't, haven't applied it to this problem, um, but we can build on a lot there. And indeed, that's why this industry has been moving so quickly uh, in the last few years, is because it really is building off of these insights from other fields. So just to give you a sense of the growth, this may not be news to, to most folks here, but uh, when we were looking at this landscape at just the end of 2016, so less than two years ago, there were arguably about four companies that we were aware of in this space. As of where we're at now, so again, less than two years forward, this is not even an exhaustive list of all of the new startup companies that have emerged tackling this problem, and each in slightly different ways. And I think that's what's particularly exciting to me, is that we're starting to see companies actually start to specialize and say, look, our core competency, our expertise is really in the scaffolding, or is really in the cell adaptation and modification. Um, and so now we're starting to get a large enough ecosystem where you can get some potential for cross-licensing and collaborations and, and building off of what other companies are doing in a collaborative sense rather than competitive. So again, quickly I'll just frame kind of what we've got coming up today so you can think about this as a, a holistic picture. On the clean meat specific side, we've got uh, panels that are with folks from within the clean meat industry and panels with folks from beyond the clean meat industry. We've got some panels that are more focused on the science and technology, while others are more focused on business strategy um, and, and how we can interface with, with other industries and other sectors as well. And then, of course, there's investors who have been really proactive um, in enabling this field to move quickly, even in the absence, in some cases, of you know, government public research funding. Investors have stepped in and said, we see the importance of this. We want to make sure this happens as soon as possible. And then towards the end of the day, similar to yesterday, we'll, we'll kind of step back with a couple of panels that speak to both plant-based meat and clean meat together. Um, so uh, from the policy perspective, there's uh, regulatory as well as labeling. I know we got into some of the nomenclature and so forth, but we'll dig a little deeper there. So that's relevant, of course, both to plant-based meat and clean meat. Uh, and then sustainability and public health. Things like life cycle analyses are really important in this field. And it's important to, to kind of iterate through those as we get a better sense of what this production process will look like. Uh, what technologies, what tools do we have at our fingertips? Um, because I think if we can keep that sustainability lens front and center, even when making some of these early R&D decisions, then we can ultimately you know, quickly get to our end goal, which is, is valuable for everyone in this room. So with that, I think we will kick it off to our very first panel. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to today.